Cool. Um. So we'll give everybody a couple minutes to join in. Oh wait, shoot. It's doing that weird thing again. Hold on. Um. Why is it not updating my slide when I go back and forth? What is happening? Oh, there we go. Okay, just take a second. Cool, cool. EGAT's time. <laughs> Yeah. So we'll give everybody maybe a couple minutes. Um, I don't think we need to make a second announcement for it. Yeah. Why, what is an EGAD and why are there so many of them? That's a great question. I, I don't know. <laughs> Inspired by steamed hams. Borealis localized entirely within your kitchen <laughs> at this time of year. <laughs> oh man. Oh, we'll start about two minutes, like round numbers, so we can get our steamed hams conversations out of the way. <laughs> Steamed clams. <laughs> it's a whole franchise here. All right. 
right, well, it is 7.05, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure hopefully some more people trickle in, but I'm excited for kickoff, the spring kickoff. I know I'm sure everybody is. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I'm Mason, of course, the president of EGATS, and I'm joined uh, by Grant, who is our main events officer, who helped pop in, help me with some hey slides guys. here and there. Um, How's it going? And we're going to go ahead and get started with some just general information about EGADS and uh, about the semester ahead. A lot of it will seem familiar and a lot of it is new, but without further ado, um, for those of you who may not know, uh, we are EGADS, the Electronic Game Developers Society on campus. We are uh, a group of passionate student game developers uh, whose mission is to grow uh, students and foster a welcoming community. Uh, we're interdisciplinary. We have a big focus on community, of course, uh, professional connections that we're very grateful for. And we're also full of creative people and intelligent people who love how to make games. So for the spring, actually, Grant, do you want to talk about our spring events since you are events? Oh, yeah. Go for it. Well, first off, we got the classic events. You know them well. Uh, general meetings. Uh, where we usually have industry speakers every other week on Tuesday workshops um, every Monday alternating between unity and art and dev nights every Thursday work on a game or just chill out you know listen to some tunes uh, and socials where we just try to have fun. Usually, you know, meet up with other orgs. That's always fun. Uh, every every other Friday. So yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of great events. So, so like Grant mentioned, our general meetings are every other Tuesday. Our first one is um, after Global Game Jam, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute. But it is the ninth, uh, February 9th is our first general meeting. And like Grant said, we often here have industry professionals to hear from, uh, like tonight. And it's a great chance to get to know about an aspect in the in the industry. You can ask questions about working in games. Um, they're some of my favorite events that you guys has put on in my three years that I've been a member. Um, and as you can see here, we've had some great uh, past speakers from a bunch of different uh, studios, which is awesome. And so. Uh, also, like Grant mentioned, we have Dev Nights um, every Thursday. Uh, it is a great, like it says, productive space to work, study, work on games, hang out. Um, they're great opportunities to meet other people and get some work done on that game that you have been either working on or putting off. Uh, for me, it is usually the latter. But <laughs> they're great chances to just get some work done and hang out with your friends. Um, workshops, of course, Mondays from 6 to 8. Uh, we do Unity and Art on alternating weeks. Um, I believe the first one is this coming Monday uh, before GGJ. And so these are great chances to learn skills that you might not have or want to improve upon. Um, I've learned a lot from these workshops. Um, they're really great opportunities. And in the spring, there's a 3D focus. So if you went to any in the fall, it was 2D and in the spring we shift off to 3D um, and they're super cool. They're hosted on Zoom and we post the links uh, the day of. Um, so look forward to that on Monday. And some big, let's see Grant, you wanna talk about these since these are main event, main events? Oh yeah, uh, two big ones coming up. So first we got Global Game Jam. Um, pretty crazy this year. Uh, it starts um, less than a week from now, uh, Wednesday. So, and, and to compensate for all the Discord stuff, you know, the lack of in-person, uh, it's all, it's like five days, yeah, five days, six days. It's a long time. Wait, I don't think I could, no, it's five days, yeah. Wednesday to Sunday. Yeah. Um, really soon. Um, uh, yeah, it's going to be kind of crazy to see the games that people who um, have all the free time in the world can make. I know. I'm excited to see. 
<laughs> just in general like yeah but um if you haven't already uh we're gonna be posting the link to join the discord and chat um, I do not have that. I should have got this. <laughs> we'll be posting the link. Hold on. We have the link. Uh. Yep. There's the link. Oh, you beat me to it. <laughs> we had it the whole time. Um. Yeah. So uh yeah join the discord and then when you're on the discord um you can sign up on the website very important to submit your game um global game jam doesn't use itch.io they use their own website to they have to submit your game on so yeah you got to create an account and uh if you join the Global Game Jam Discord, there's uh, a very long um, and insightful and informative announcement um, that MJ, who is the organizer, posted with a uh, link to the actual GGJ website and instructions on how to sign up, um, just general code of conduct and, and rules for that. So if you join the Discord, um, there will be a lot more information uh, about the steps for it and finding a team and, and what it's going to look like overall. So... Um, including signing up on the website which you do have to do if you're going to jam so like grant said it'll be a, it'll be a great event um i think the numbers are already looking good for people who have signed up so i'm looking forward to seeing what people are going to create should be very exciting um Ooh, okay <laughs> all right uh and then there's gdc squared um now it's gonna yeah it's gonna be a lot different from past years but basically it's kind of like our own GDC game dev conference. I guess this year is not really GDC squared because uh, it's not in the GDC. It's there. Um, we're there in spirit. GDC. Uh, to the negative one, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's we're just going to have one ongoing stream on Twitch throughout the day. You can kind of hop in and hop out of, you know, for the panels that you need, you, you want, you're interested in. Um, so that's kind of what, uh, to expect there. Um, but yeah, I hope, I think hoping to get some good people this year, uh, to hear some talk. It is basically just like a big, long general meeting. So it should be, it should be great. Yeah, in in years past, it's been my favorite thing that eGods has done, and I think this year it'll also be. We streamlined it a lot, like Grant said, just to make it easier and more accessible for everyone across the board, given the times, uh, students and industry alike. But we are still, I'm still very excited about it. We're still going to have some great speakers who, uh, with great topics, and like it says, the schedule is to be determined. And we're still finalizing some things there, but it will be on Saturday, that 27th of February. And we will have more information for y'all um, in the coming weeks about what it's going to look like some more. But all three of these bullets are true, um, will still be true for this year, and I'm super excited. Um, so moving on, if you want to stay connected with eGads and aren't already, um, here's how you can do so. I'll, I'll leave this up for a minute in case anybody wants to furiously type, but I imagine all of y'all here very likely already have this information. Um, but we have a Facebook group. Um, we have, of course, the Discord. And then we have a newsletter, which gets sent out periodically about updates and events um, that we have uh, on the horizon. So like I said, all of these are, are within our Discord in one way or another. So if you are already in there, then you can quickly find the others. But. Yeah, so next up, if you want to formally join eGads, um, it is only $10 for the whole year. Um, you can follow the instructions here to message um, Elena uh, with your full name, EID, and t-shirt size, and then message her for confirmation. I can say that we do have the t-shirts in. Um, They're at the GDC, and we are going to be getting out information on how to pick those up if you are in Austin safely of course 
we will have more information about that in the coming days um, but it will be a, a bit of an ongoing process so we will we will update y'all if you bought a shirt and are in Austin we our plan is to safely get it to you um, and if you're not in Austin but you bought a shirt we will hold it for you um, until it's safe to come get it but we'll have more information about that within uh, the coming week than the next few days so look out for an announcement for that and if you want to buy a t-shirt now um, you know, follow these instructions want to become a member of eGods we would love to have you as a formal member so you can get your sweet sweet I think it's the next side t-shirt which um, <laughs> that was not as $10. big of a build up as I wanted $10 it to be for $10 this. for this shirt is very That's awesome a steal. Um, what it's <laughs> It's a fantastic shirt, and I'm very excited to get mine and start giving everybody else theirs. Oh, so, you're gonna look like such a gamer. You are gonna look like a gamer, and oh, you can wear it in your Zoom classes, and and your professors and classmates will say, "Wow, look at this gamer! I want a T-shirt like that." And then you can say, "Join Egads," and you can get a T-shirt like this. Boom. Mic drop. So. <laughs> It's a great t-shirt. We would love to have you buy it and support eGuds. So, um, quick shout out to our uh, related orgs, um, Longhorn Gaming and Women in Gaming. Uh, we both, uh, we like to partner with both these orgs. Uh, they're run by great people, um, great orgs. I'm sure many, if not all of you, are members or have heard of either of these orgs. So, we do a lot of stuff with them. We enjoy their partnership and working together with them on things. So shout out to them. And then thanks, of course, to our sponsor for this year, Zynga, um, of whom there is a speaker here tonight is from Zynga. Excited. So they have been a generous supporter of EGADS for as long as I've been in the club. Um, we're very grateful for their support and their continued uh, sponsorship of our dear organization. So, um, does anyone have any questions you can type it in chat we'll we'll leave it open for uh, a minute or two before we get going but um if if you have questions after tonight feel free to at any of the officers in the discord you can uh, direct message any of the officers we are happy to help and answer questions in any way that we can um i'm not seeing anything in the chat so I think we might go ahead and get started with our talk so we can get on with the night. Um, very exciting. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Ice, who is a vice president of games at Zynga. Um, he, of course, is part of the studio that sponsored us this year. So we're very grateful for him to be here. Um, and so what I'll do is quit the slides. And Andrew, if you want to share your screen, I will go ahead and pop it up for you oh gosh where'd my window capture go hold on ah. <laughs> it okay, i feel like i always have to do this there we go okay can everybody see that or not uh it looks like now they they ought to be able to now okay oh yeah looks good Why is yeah my, there we go yep looks great um Oh, yeah, 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 that's good. Well, hey, everybody. Um, and can everybody hear me just fine, yes? Yeah, we can hear you. Seems like it. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, it's it's great to be here and, uh, to, you know, to participate in, in you know, great student-run uh, organizations like this. Um, uh, like Andrew said, um, you know, I, I have been at Zynga now for a while and have been an active participant in us sponsoring programs like this. Um, and what I thought could be useful um, for you all is to get a little bit better picture of what the sort of the business side of games ultimately actually looks like um, and how that translates into how we make things better for our players. Um, this is an area that I think if you grow up playing games, certain like like I did, and I'm sure like all of you have, that this is um, you know pretty uncharted territory typically. Um, and um, but it's really important if ultimately you want to get into a career of making games to understand these aspects of it. So I was hoping 
to go through sort of a high level aspect of that, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that anybody has about any of this stuff, whether it's that or just, you know, making fun stuff or anything in between um, as we go through it. So uh, please interrupt me if you have any questions too, that's no problem with that as well. Sound good? Okay, I'll, I'll take I'll take that as a I'll take that as a yes. Um, um, the first, I thought it might be useful for you guys to just understand like who's talking to you and what you know what's my background before getting into games. Um, so uh, I did an you know undergrad degree at Wake Forest University, which is in North Carolina, um, in management information systems, which was. Um, essentially a dual degree program between the business school and um, computer science, which was an interesting degree. Uh, that means that at this point I am a terrible programmer, but I could still probably do some things that were clunky. Um, uh, I also um, got my MBA, but from UT here in Austin, and that's when my wife and I moved here to Austin in 2008. So we've been here for um, a little over 12 years and, and you know, very much still love it uh, being here. Uh, my wife is a native Texan. I am not, um, and she was very happy to come uh, home. Um, but as you can see from the list, you know, after that, I did a variety of things that have nothing to do with games before I ultimately got to games. Um, uh, the first thing I did out of college was the Peace Corps, of all things. Um, uh, that went into strategy consulting. I worked in sort of the biotech and physical science startup world for several years. Um, none of those things probably would point to games at all. <laughs> um, and it's a little bit happenstance of how I ended up here. Um, but what I wanted to sort of show with a little bit of that is for all of you that are thinking about this and working on your own games and, you know, getting involved in the communities here as, you know, you're 18 to 22 years old, you've got at least 10 years ahead where I was. Um, so, you know, kudos to all of you for, for seeing this and thinking about um, ways and careers to sort of get into this world. Um, I am, I feel very fortunate to work in games at this point. Um, while it is generally the most sort of, I would say, stressful and hardest job I've had, it's easily the most fun. And a lot of the things and stereotypes that you would think about working in games are totally true. Like, I play games for many, many hours every day for work. <laughs> that is true. Um, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, so, uh, and it would be hard to trade that for many things at this point, to be honest. So anyway, um, just wanted to show you guys that there's a lot of different ways to sort of get here in the end. Um, and uh, and quite a few different paths in, in, that are that look like mine and, and that they made no sense um, ultimately getting into games. So. Um, so anyway, um, uh, the the part that I think is really interesting and sort of frames this pretty well is is how games have evolved um, as both a business and how they're made. Um, many of you probably know a bunch of this, but um, games are bigger than film and TV and music combined as a business today, which is pretty remarkable. Um, uh, this past year, the latest estimates have the global games market at $180 billion, which is sort of staggering. Um, one of the reasons for this is nearly half the world's population plays games at this point, um, which, is, which is a pretty staggering amount of people that are engaging in, in content like this as well, which is pretty cool. Um, the place where... Uh, Zynga, uh, my company participates is in the mobile market, obviously, um, which is the biggest of these pies at this point, which it's it's approaching a hundred billion dollars alone just on mobile. Um, so this is a huge business that does mean downstream things are you know um, have some impact, but it is it's pretty staggering that despite you know film and TV and music, um, you know, being uh, very, very visible forms of entertainment games is much bigger than all of those together. So um, that also means that because it's such a growing industry, it again is a nice place and a good place to develop a career. Um, the other big thing that's really changed, and I realize that these are kind of ugly slides, but um, is that the business of building a game has dramatically changed in the last 10 years. Um, so 
for a very long period of time, the way that game development worked, whether it was, you know, old console games or even before that stuff on Atari, or if you even think before that, things like uh, pinball machines. Um, what you would do is you would spend a lot of time uh, making a game, um, spend a lot of money, and then you would release it. And um, you would really hope that you made basically all the money back that you had spent to make this thing in the first month. It looked and smelled a whole lot like a blockbuster Hollywood movie release where basically the success of the product or the, the entertainment vehicle that you made was dictated by how the first 24 hours went. That is how games worked for a very long period of time. Um, that business model sucks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really tough and it, it creates a, quite a bit of stress for a lot of different people. Um, what has really changed over time um, for most of the game industry at this point, certainly not all, but most, is that we spend uh, a lot of time, but not as much, making a game, and then we launch it, and um, we slowly start to make uh, money over time. But by the end of that, say, 12th month, we have a we have a business that's starting to look more like a subscription and a whole lot less like a um, singular entertainment um, vehicle. And that is why games in particular have grown over time is because there's so many games, whether you think of League of Legends or uh, Zynga Poker on our end or Clash of Clans or uh, too many games to name um, that have been around for literally a decade or more. Um, and um, so that has really changed the way that games are made and how they're managed and what the business model behind them dictates. And it also changes how we design them and how we think about uh, designing games, which is a big part of what I do um, every single day. So anyway, um, that, that matters a lot, probably more than you think it does for what kind, how you think about a game and, and its, its development cycle and how you make it. Um, Cool. Any questions on any of that before I keep going? No. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, well, uh, so we're going to jump then into like speaking numbers in games, which is a huge part of um, game development, whether it's mobile or PC or console at this point, and how we think about the health of those products and how we can make those games. Uh, better for our players. Um, so if you think about um, sort of the core tenets of mobile game um, sort of management and um, measurement, um, there's essentially three pillars to the, to the stool with a, sort of a half pillar in the middle. Um, the very first one is retention, which is the ability for us to keep players around in the game for a long time. Um, Words with Friends, which is the icon up top, which is one of Zynga's um, most renowned uh, games. It's been around for ages. This is its core strength. It retains players really, really well over many, many years. Um, the second pillar down in the bottom right is distribution. That's our ability to get more people into the game um, in, a, in an efficient manner. So. Zynga Poker, which is Zynga's oldest and largest, ultimately, game um, over time, um, really has succeeded here. A new game that one of that my team is responsible for, Harry Potter Puzzles and Spells, that just came out, also has succeeded or excelled because of distribution, getting being able to get a lot of players into the game. Um, and then the last stool here is monetization, because ultimately, we are making entertainment products that need to be fun and entertaining, but they also need to make money at some point in their life. And monetization is sort of the third uh, pillar here. Um, uh, engagement here, so you know how people engage in the actual game is sort of the glue between retention and monetization. And it's very important for how we think about how players are enjoying and or not enjoying uh, the game experience. Um, Ultimately, for a game to excel and exceed, you know, expectations and, and do well over many years, you have to be world class at at least one of those pillars. If you are not, the game will probably fail. If you're average at all of them, it probably won't work. Um, and that's 
a pretty critical aspect into how we, along with many other game publishers at this point, think about success and or failure of the, the products that we make. Um, so we're going to go through a little bit more detail of each of what each of these things and what they mean. Some of you may totally understand this, um, and uh, but hopefully it's it's useful and, and interesting information. Um, so we're going to start with distribution. Um, as I said, distribution is just the ability to bring new players into our games efficiently. How many people can you get into a game? You know, to ultimately hopefully build a large player audience over time. Um, the way that you can think about this is, is what we would call, or most of the industry would call, call cost per install or CPI, which is the acronym that is very frequently used. This is simply the amount of money it costs us to get one install. So lower is better. Um, this is a very important, uh, KPI in overall making games more so than you would probably, um, imagine when you're, um, sitting around making a cool shooter. Uh, but ultimately, this is a huge part of whether a game will succeed or not, is how efficiently you can get people into the game. Um, and the CPI, um, or cost per install, is dictated by three different things, um, uh, two of which are totally in game studios' control. Um, the first one is not the market, so how much does it cost to get eyeballs on those ads? Um, that's dictated by the market, but the second two are totally dictated by uh, the beautiful art and the creatives that our teams make um, to show off the game, and, and how effective those are at getting people into the game ultimately dictates um, a, a cheaper price if we can do a good job there. And so um, this has been pretty empowering sort of information for, say, our art teams um, on our games to understand how much they can impact the marketing just by making badass cool art um, and making it beautiful. So uh, that's that's distribution in a nutshell. Um, and uh, there have been too many games to count that have been amazing games, beautiful, uh, really, really fun. And because they were not efficient at getting uh, new players in the door, they ultimately didn't work. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, the second thing we're going to go through is retention. Um, and retention is something that you guys have likely heard before. Um, it is both quite useful and maybe not so useful sometimes. Um, all retention is, is the measure of whether a player returns to a game. That's it. It's very binary in nature. Um, and, but it is used as a proxy for player interest, um, and whether a player is having a good time. So, um, probably can understand this, but a very common term, if you were ever to work in a game studio, you would hear D1 retention. And all that means is the ratio of players who played one day after installing relative to the number of installs the day before. And this is usually a proxy for people thinking, okay, that was fun enough for me to try again. Um, that, was, that was neat. I think I'd give it a shot. It doesn't mean that somebody loved the game, uh, could be quite far from it. But it means that they had enough interest or a good enough experience that they thought, OK, I'll give it another shot. Um, similarly, um, very frequent and common term you'd hear is D30 retention. And this is, as you would expect, the ratio of players who've played on the 30th day after installing. Um, this is commonly thought of as um, something around, I love this game. If you're playing on the 30th day after installing, that probably means that you are pretty interested and in, into this game. Um, and that is mostly true, uh, but with some caveats. Um, uh, one of the things that's really changed uh, for our teams is that, and you know, if you look at retention curves, which again, this would be an incredibly common thing to see at any game developer at this point. Um, these are two, two games, you know, that are that are real in the world. And um, while the orange line is higher than the blue line all the way along, um, one of the things that I think is a meaningful learning for us is that the second game, sorry, the first game, the blue line is probably a better thing long-term because it's a less shallow or more shallow curve, meaning longer term as you go further out, um, you're more likely to keep people much, much longer. And, 
um, as I alluded to before with that business model of keeping players around and engaging them for a long, much longer periods of time, it's much more important that we're good long-term than we're necessarily really great short-term. Um, so that's been a big, that's a bit of big um, change again in the industry as a whole in how we think about what good and healthy looks like. Um, the next, the next sort of aspect of this that we think about a lot is, is engagement. Um, and engagement is a term that's, you know, used very, very loosely for a lot of things interchangeably. Um, but for us at Zynga, you know, we think of this as the glue that's connecting retention or the ability to keep people around to ultimately monetization and our ability to make a game a business. Um, and if we do a good job with engagement, that's the thing that will drive long-term improvements in both, both of those aspects. Um, we think about engagement in, in a couple different ways. Um, ultimately, we break it into three sort of buckets. And this is something that, you know, all of our game teams, whether you're a product manager or you're a game designer or an artist or a developer, that you're thinking about as you are trying to make the game better. Um, and these are sort of what we will call breadth, depth, and intensity. So the first thing is breadth. And um, this is, you know, you can think about any different game, but this is just simply the proportion of players that engage in your core loop in a single day. So if you think about, um, say, a shooter game, um, this would be the number or the proportion of players that uh, came into the game at all, uh, as the denominator and the numerator would be the proportion of people that simply entered a battle, so the core loop of the game. Um, all this is telling you is how many people are getting into the funnel of actually playing the game as opposed to just showing up. Um, so that's the first, the first step. The second step that we think about a lot is the depth. So of those people that got into a single battle, um, how many times did they engage in that loop? So how many uh, battles did they go through? Um, that's very important for understanding actual depth of interest in the core loop of the game and how people are making progress, et cetera. Um, the third component is what we call intensity. And um, this can be used in a bunch of different ways, but if we use the, the, the first person shooter as an analogy, this is mostly akin to of the people that engaged in the core loop and participated in multiple times, what did they actually do while engaging in the core loop? How intense was their engagement within that, say, battle itself? Um, those three things add up to a good or a bad player experience. And obviously, we want to make it a really, really good one, just like anybody would, um, and you know, push and help players um, improve on all three of those vectors um, yeah, to, to make their game experience a better one. Um, and this can be visualized uh, in a chart kind of like this that has um, a, a, actually four different vectors of information here. But um, you know, in this example, the number of players is on the x-axis. The uh, y-axis is the depth. So the, the number of interactions and then the bubble size is the intensity. And you can start to see with different pieces of content in this example, um, which pieces of content are the most engaging. A big bubble out to the right probably means that it's more interesting to players than say these little ones to the left. And that really helps us understand um, on any game, what players are enjoying um, and, and what types of content are they liking so we can make more of it and make that experience better for them. Um, okay, and then the last sort of bucket here is, is monetization, which um, um, really has changed a lot in the whole gaming world, you know, over the last 10 plus, last 10 plus years. Um, for us, as we think about monetization, it's, it's really no different than any under any other industry. It's our ability to connect that value to players so they're interested enough that they want to either buy something or watch an ad or some combination of the two. Ultimately, if a player monetizes, that means they value our products. Um, it's as simple as that. And so um, there's a couple common terms in terms of measurement here that uh, you would hear very frequently in any industry, or sorry, any company. 
Um, one is simply called ARPDAO, which is you know used all the time, and it's the amount of revenue or average revenue per daily active user. So you have 200,000 people play a game. Uh, that game makes $200,000 in that day. The average revenue uh, per daily active user was a dollar. Um, and this is a very common sort of metric to understand overall monetization, sort of business health um, of a game. Um, that KPI is made up of a couple different things. Um, and um, they are around the number of people that pay and the amount of money that they actually pay of those who pay. And for games with basically the same ARP DAO, you can have an incredibly different makeup on those two components, uh, depending on what type of game it is and the strengths of the, the product, et cetera. Um, the third component of this is called, is often referred to as ARPU, which is simply average revenue per user. And the only reason that that's different from ARP DAO that we just talked about is that it is almost always focused on periods longer than one day. And because of that, it is actually the equivalent of, or the cumulative product of all these things that we've already talked about, retention and engagement and monetization over 30 days, say if we're talking about day 30. Um, this is um, essentially measured lifetime value, which is something that you have likely heard if, you, if you've been in sort of a more math oriented class. and. Um, is a super critical aspect of sort of overall uh, game uh, management. Um, and this is ultimately how we judge the health of, say, new initiatives. Um, ARPU, uh, cumulative ARPU, is, is a pretty core tenement to how we think about like a new piece of content that we developed, whether it was good for our players or not. Um, so um, anyway, I thought, um, you know, with sort of a maybe a different take than than maybe necessarily the some of the presentations you've gotten, this would help um, some of you understand. You know, the the underbelly, I guess, of, of games and how they become businesses, as well as you know, in addition to sort of the the cool products that you're making. Um, uh, for you guys, I think that there's probably three big takeaways, at least from sort of what I've walked through here. Um, the first one and the most important one is is just understanding the business model, and there are quite a few different ones within games um, of what either the product that you're working on or the company that you're thinking about going to. You know, as you assess your options, you do need to understand that uh, more so than whether this is just a cool product that you like, because that business model um, dictates quite a bit more about what is going to be made and what you're going to work on than you might think. Um, the second one is for us, just like many other companies, engagement is ultimately the really the critical thing. And if you're on a game development team, it's likely that you will be spending a large, large amount of time working on things to try to help engagement. And so that's a great thing for you guys to understand more if you can. Um, and lastly, uh, just in general, the idea that numbers and, and telemetry and um, sort of analytics um for every single discipline within the game development framework are are very much a friend your friend and not your enemy um there was a long period of time as sort of traditional game developers went through having analytics become a portion of how they tried to make decisions that there was quite a bit of backlash just like there is in any creative industry um but the reality is it made a lot of the games tremendously better and um uh for tons of disciplines, and again, down to the most creative, say like concept art, um, analytics can actually still be a very helpful asset for you to sort of help make something better for your player base. So, uh, anyway, that's the whole that's the whole presentation. But I hope that that was sort of helpful in understanding a bit more about um, how game development actually works on on some of these things and how your, it dictates what you are uh, gonna make. And um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has, or if, if anything has come up in the chat, I haven't been able to see chat. Uh, we, we, well, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, it was very informative. We do have a question uh, a little while ago that popped up in chat. It says, uh, earlier you talked about the CPI of installs. Do you think game companies will move away from physical copies given that the digital seems cheaper? For sure. 
Yes, I, I think that not only will they, they mostly already are. Um, so uh, to be honest, I'll be surprised if the next generation of consoles even has anything physical available at all. It's kind of being phased out in this generation, but I'd be very surprised if the PS6 had a drive whatsoever. No, you know that 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 does not surprise me, and I'll because I I bought a disc version of the PS5, but I don't plan on even if it's available of buying a disc version of the next console, just because yep. like what you're saying, it's so, uh, it's cheaper to be made digitally and sell digitally, and it's starting to get to the point where I'm just old because I like buying my discs. Um, <laughs> I feel like a yeah. lot of people are just shifting over to to just downloading things digitally, and it's definitely easier. Um, yep. And so yep. quick follow-up question to that that the same person just typed. Uh, what do you think that means, what you were just talking about, the CPI of installs, what do you think that means for brick-and-mortar stores such as GameStop and um, that kind of area of, of retail? Sure. Um, so there's, there's two things. So one, I want to make sure that what I'm talking about with cost per install is, is, is super clear. Um, the cost per install in that framework for all of game developers, whether you're console or PC or, um, uh, or mobile, doesn't actually have anything to do with whether somebody spends $60 on a physical um, copy of a game or not. It is the cost for the company to get that person to buy it. <laughs> um, so, so, so does that make sense? So like if you are going in to buy a, a game at GameStop as an example, or go going to buy a game at Best Buy, uh, the way that, that a company or a game developer would be thinking that was how much did it cost ultimately from overall marketing of our products to get that person to go in to get it. Uh, and that's what we're talking about when it comes to cost per install. Mm -hmm. For GameStop, I have no idea. I mean, mm -hmm. they have, they have succeeded for much longer than I expected. <laughs> you know, if I would have been a betting person in 2008, I would have guessed that GameStop wouldn't have made it out of 2010. Um, and clearly that was uh, dead wrong. Um, so so I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, um, they have been able to hang on for a very long time, which is pretty unique in the retail space. Maybe they'll they'll maybe they'll keep hanging then a little longer. <laughs> I mean, it's it's quite impressive, honestly, yeah. how well they've been able to stick around. There you go. Um, let's see. We have another question. It says a little bit of a vague question, but what do you think is the future of games? Huh. Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I have had the same experience that I think many have when they've tried uh, stuff on the the Oculus of like being totally wowed. You know, it's like just mm -hmm. absolutely amazing um, and. Um, it feels pretty groundbreaking. Um, unfortunately, there are no games in VR, certainly that I've tried, that have that last as an interesting thing for more than about a week. Um, so I have both really high hopes that somebody smart is going to make something that really takes advantage of how cool that technology can be. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, there just isn't anything there. So I do think that that's really neat. We have... Um, a group of former folks from Zynga that have just started a new VR um, studio in LA, um, and I hope I hope they're the ones that figure it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I think that's really interesting. I don't know that 5G is going to actually make a huge difference in games. I'm not a huge believer in anything that like is happening with Google Stadia um, because yeah. the latency is still super rough. Um, so um, the the, to, to the vague question, I can give a little bit of a vague answer. I think that the, one of the biggest things that's happened in games in the last 10 years is actually less technological in nature. It's that um, games were made for people that were not core gamers. So the reason that games exploded is not because the stereotypical, you know, 19-year-old dude is playing more games. It's actually that um, your mom is actually playing games and sometimes your grandma is playing games. Um, so, um, the biggest thing that's really happened is the accessibility of way more games being interesting for more people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually expect that that's going to happen even more so in the, in the future. Yeah. 
I, I would hope so too. And I know that accessibility is, I mean, that goes hand in hand with the mobile platform, yeah. considering everyone's got a phone and everyone can download apps and it doesn't cost you 500 bucks. Um, yeah. So it's, I, I do definitely see that kind of um, just more people aggregating into, into playing games, not necessarily, like you said, people buying more games. Yep. Um, yep. Definitely. Well, let's see. Next question I've got is, uh, from Glathulu in chat, do you think that keeping such a focus on that uh, analytics triangle is universal to the game dev industry or more useful in a corporate development setting? So I guess uh, it seems like they're asking if that analytics triangle is more useful to the like back end producers or the, the devs actually grinding it out um, is how I understand that. Sure. I, well, I'll try to answer it two ways. Um, if you think about say an individual studio, um, I do think that information is incredibly mm -hmm. useful for um, every team member, essentially. Um, now, with the folks like product managers in our team that are incredibly focused on that, that's probably going to be a bigger part of, say, their day. But um, what we learned, I think, over um, you know many failures on this front, but ultimately, I think, have gotten it right, is that um, if you make all of that data and information as accessible as possible, it just allows people to make better decisions. Um, and in fact, you don't know how people are going to need or want it. Um, so just make it so everybody can can look at this stuff and, and it helps them out. Um, if you think about the broader games industry, um, definitely not everybody looks at it this way. Um, but it has, if you thought of it, I, so I started at Zynga in 2012. Um, at that point, um, you know, Zynga had essentially created this as an idea within games. Um, it, first it was lauded, then it was hated. Um, then it started to make this very slow sort of recovery back into being, um, um, thought of as like a positive, um, everybody in mobile uses this. So like, this is just mm -hmm. universal mobile. It's now pretty universal in PC. Um, uh, console is where it's not at all. Um, and console, I think, will just catch up, It would be my guess. Do you have any thoughts as to why they might be lagging behind? Because that's really interesting to me. Um, considering I feel like everyone, regardless of platform, has the same goals for like units they want to sell and retention they want to gain. Um, sure. So I guess, yeah. do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I can. I have guesses, um, yeah. but I don't know, I know exactly. So okay, one so is that... Yeah. One is that the business model in console is different. Mm -hmm. So console games, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, are starting to introduce, you know, in-app purchase and or subscription or skins, that kind of stuff. But it's slow going. Yeah, it's slower going. Mm -hmm. It's still primarily, do you want to spend 50, 60, 70 dollars to buy the game? That's still primarily the business model. Mm -hmm. um, and so um that doesn't make it nearly as much of a sort of service oriented, you know, long lifetime game, which is where the analytics portion really comes in quite heavily. Um, so that's a big one. Um, some of it's just like the, the background of the studios, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's plenty of people that are uh, amazing at what they do that have been working in console development for, you know, approaching 30 years now. Um, habits are hard break. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? um, so some of it's, you know, I'm sure inertia, um, just in the same way that Zynga as a mobile developer is um, getting old uh, relative to many other mobile developers. And mm -hmm. so it's a big thing for us to not let inertia set in for us to right, and make sure that we're constantly sort of reinventing ourselves. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense as well. Um, thank you. So let's see. Next question from the book is better. Uh, do you think the games market will always be diverse enough to have room for so many different types of games, uh, like indies, AAA console exclusive, more casual mobile games, etc.? I think from a great question. From a game type, absolutely. I think that there is pretty much insatiable ap appetite for a tremendous variety of games. Um, so I think that that is, um, you know, as good as it's ever been. And I think it's just going to continue to get wider and better. Um, 
from a publishing standpoint, so indie developers versus big, um, big folks like us, um, it's never been a worse time to be an indie developer right now, to be honest. Um, and it's not because it's not because there's not a tremendously talented teams doing it. It's just because um, uh, of Apple and Google. <laughs> it's because um, and Sony and Microsoft really. Uh, it's it's just because the ability to get surfacing is just much much more difficult. There was a time period when the app stores on mobile were new, and if you launched a new game and it was good, there was a very good chance that it would get noticed and you'd get a ton of downloads and you know start to build up an audience and so that's where a ton of indie developers had a lot of success um now surfacing is so tough it's it's just a tough nut to crack and i hope it's i hope it gets solved but that's kind of where we're at right now no i I do see that and i hope i hope that evens out because there's you know like you said there's talent at all levels but it's definitely hard to get past the the giants of the of the industry um just since they conglomerate a lot yeah um, yeah. yeah, no, it's very informative. Um, I had a question for you. I don't see any new ones in chat, so I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, uh-huh. You talked about like day one retention and day 30 retention, which um, you know I've heard before and I'm sure a lot of other people have. Um, do they do that or do y'all do that for larger metrics, like one year retention, six months, even more? Because um, I was thinking games uh, just, you know, everyone knows like Fortnite, for example, has been giant for years and mm-hmm. so i'm just curious if there are metrics that go even further beyond 30 days or even beyond like a year just to see how many of those like die hard die hard players are sticking around um yeah, yeah so. no absolutely uh, yeah i uh i can't tell you the numbers of but course, i can so. tell i can tell you that you know i certainly know off the top of my head what our one year retention numbers are in all of yeah. our games um and you know we think about um, lifetime value um, over even much longer time frames. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a, just a huge shift. We are thinking about uh, those long term numbers quite um, significantly. When when I was talking about retention and that slope, so that relationship between day one and day thirty, and mm-hmm. and you wanting a shallower um, curve shape, the reason that that's important is not because um uh because it's not because it's perfect it's because when you develop a new game one of the things that's really hard to know is how how it's going to do in a year or two and it turns out that the slope of that curve is quite a bit more predictive than say what day 30 is hmm. as an example so that's why we end up focusing on the slope more than the discrete numbers um because we're trying to understand you know how, how do we think this game is going to be doing in a year uh, based on those patterns, so. Huh. So I guess would you use old models predictively for new games? Uh, I mean, sh- I yes. See, yeah. I uh, they, yes. Yes. They get they get changed quite a bit, but yeah. absolutely, we're using information historically from all the games that we've launched to try to understand how the next games are going to do. Okay. Nice. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I I don't see any other questions in chat and that was that was my big one that i wanted to talk about um if anyone has any more questions feel free to ask them uh, we have a little bit more time um i'll just see a second if people start typing um, okay. hmm. i mean this is a relatively small group what are the majors of everybody in this group in general most like people i it's a split um majority split between uh, computer science uh, like myself and then arts and entertainment technologies which is uh, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the AAT program but it's like a design um, more design oriented instead of math and uh, like math oriented and then uh, yep. RTF which is the film school radio television film that's where the majority of our members come from but we have uh, odds and ends from everywhere English, biology, engineering we have a couple engineering people uh, but those are mm-hmm. the three main main fields uh, that a lot of our members are from yeah. nice yeah we have a great little, great little group I can't say little it's a pretty big group but <laughs> we, we have a lot of a lot of different studies which makes it good to, good to learn from everyone a lot of different disciplines but, nice 
Well, I haven't seen anything else pop up, and, and I don't have any other questions myself. I feel like I learned a lot from your talk. Um, okay. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we before we call it and wrap up? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, just, you know, I'm excited for, for all of you. I'm sure this has been a very challenging, you know, last 10 months as a, as a college student, um, uh, just like it has been for many of us in other areas. But um, um, I hope you guys all come out of come out of this better on, you know, better on the other side. And, um, you know, uh, if you're into games, um, which it sounds like, you know, you guys all must be, um, um, I think it's a, it's an amazing place to build a career. Um, and it, it for sure will not be exactly what you expect. Like nothing ever is, but it is really cool to be able to make things for people that they greatly enjoy and to have, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people play them. Like it's, it's, uh, it feels good. It's like, a, it's a fun thing to do. So, uh, very much encourage you guys to continue down that path if you like it. Well, that is, that is exactly what brought me onto the path, you know, making, making things for people to enjoy. So it's, yep. it's nice to hear you say that. Um, awesome. well, in that case, I think we'll go ahead and end it. Um, thank you everyone who came to our kickoff meeting and once again thank you Andrew for giving yeah. us a nice talk um, thanks so much Andrew yeah, yeah absolutely I will All right. go ahead yes, thank you. in the stream bye y'all thanks for coming I hope everybody's first week of classes went well and we will see y'all at the next EGADS event and stream bye.